Sending a patient back there knowing they're COVID positive is a big mistake. 14 presumptive cases of coronavirus in Louisiana. It was uh, bizarre that the, uh, the Rolls Royce of uh, nursing homes was not going to test everybody. It's a high level of concern right now. So you're basically sending typhoid Mary to the nursing home to infect the other people. The number of nursing home clusters of coronavirus in Louisiana has risen today. I don't today. know what to think. I don't know what to trust. This is, this is terrible. I'm extremely upset. If he is infected, we might not see him this again. This is a cluster that is extremely concerning. Do you think those people all had to die? No, I don't think so. If anything, we have underreported COVID deaths in Jefferson Parish. In I do believe the nursing we homes were victims. With the Limit world. exposure to the most vulnerable. cannot even the lay their, their loved ones to rest. We have some nursing homes. Cases. COVID-19 is really just looking for the, for the money. From the earliest days of the COVID-19 pandemic, it was clear the coronavirus would show Louisiana's nursing homes no mercy. Mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters died in droves as their loved ones and the world were locked out. Working from our living rooms at first, a team of investigative journalists at WWL-TV worked feverishly for months to penetrate that invisible wall around nursing homes and long-term care facilities to show how the virus spread so quickly and to hold those responsible for their care accountable. The state's nursing home lobby is widely considered among the most influential. And when the state health department started refusing to name where the outbreaks were happening, we found another way. From problems with infection control to staffing shortages that put the sick at greater risk, inspections that happened too late after dozens had already died, and controversial drugs given without permission. I'm Katie Moore, and this is an Eyewitness News special investigation, Standard of Care. She's 90 now. They can sense it. It's just gut feeling that I knew something was not right. Oh, oh yes, I am very much worried about it. Sights. I need to see her. I need to see her. But there's nothing I can do. Absolutely nothing. I wanted to know what was going on and it was like we were in the dark. Family members were in the dark. Sounds. It was just very very stressful because I knew I couldn't go over there. You know, I could go and start banging on the door, but then they'd call the police. Touch. I'll always be there for my dad. But it's awkward to not be able to have those touches and have those kisses. The only way you can see your family is if they come to the glass wall. I feel like I'm kind of abandoned her. Is she asking why you haven't come to visit? Oh no, she won't, she won't ask that because she won't remember. All gone, fleeting chances to make memories missed for those who are shut out, while the pain of it all fills the void. I made the decision in my mind that I'd rather have my dad um, alive and lonely, opposed to um, him being deceased. And um, that's just a decision that we've had to make. It took two weeks before they could even cremate her body because of the backlog. What are you praying for right now? That I may live to bury her. I, I don't want to be affected with that virus and not be able to, uh, uh, to bury my mom. This is our family. This is our, these are our memoirs. Yeah, she started out at the uh, Greyhound bus station. She worked the uh, counter for colors. It's an old picture of her at the Punch Train Hotel. And her favorite thing was serving the mile high pie. Jim Crow prevented her from eating one. Now coronavirus threatens to bookend her otherwise well-lived life with cruelty. She loved to travel, but now she's locked tight inside LaFawn Nursing Home. And she still says cha-ching. 
<laughs> Instead of saying who that, she says cha-ching. Remember the years we would say cha-ching? She would freeze her beer. <laughs> <laughs> Two cans of slits. You know? <laughs> I love telling everyone I had my first beer at a same game with my grandmother out of her purse. A memory they both keep, but Eliza can't remember what she had for lunch. Alzheimer's is chipping away at her memory. She remembers me, and I was told eventually she won't remember me, so that's why I try and see her as much as possible. And right now he can't. As we age, we lose our family, we lose our friends. Isolation adds to an individual's demise. I was visiting her mid-March, and as I was walking out, they said, this is the last day you'll be able to see your mom. Just like any song worth playing, life is a progression. And as Janet Jordan will tell you, so is death. But I wanted to make sure that I was gonna be there. So it's, facing that is, it's kind of cruel, you know, <laughs> to, um, I mean, I haven't gone this long without seeing her for 15 years. Her mom battled through COVID at St. Luke's nursing home on the West Bank. A bed sore then led doctors to send her to hospice care. I hope her spirit lasts um, until this is lifted so I can see her before she passes. I want her spirit still in there when I see her. Nobody should die without their family members at their side. Nobody. In that dark window, out of arm's reach, is Janet Jordan's mother. This was Mother's Day. Janet says she's never been more grateful to see someone else eat an oyster po' boy. Jordan, Edward Mitchell, Carter, and their families, they are why it matters. The masks, the PPE, the tests, all of it, it's to keep them and their memories alive. There will be a brighter day. Where the nursing home residents have died has been a secret since late March, when the health department stopped naming the facilities. Using death records from Orleans, Jefferson, and St. Tammany parishes, we uncovered 16 homes where more than five people have died of COVID-19. You can see them on this map. The larger the circle, the greater the death toll. I remember one discussion I had with an ER doc. She said, don't admit this patient. He has COVID. Send back to the nursing home. Because of their age and their existing health conditions, LaCourt and other nursing home administrators who asked not to be identified said hospitals pushed the patients toward hospice care back at the nursing homes, fearing projections that they were about to be overwhelmed by a surge of COVID patients in need of ventilators, then in short supply. So you're basically sending typhoid Mary to the nursing home to infect other people. LaCourt says he thinks nursing homes are the victims, but could the nursing homes have done more to stop the spread? In examining federal documents called Medicare Infection Control Surveys, we found some red flags about some of the homes hit hardest by the virus. Of those 16 homes hit the hardest, half were given F ratings by federal inspectors for infection control, three of them for repeat deficiencies. Just last week, residents gathered together on the balconies at Maison Orleans Nursing Home on General Taylor Uptown. Federal inspectors cited the facility in 2017 and again last November. Among other things, this inspection report found two nurses' aides did not properly dispose of their gloves or wash their hands after dealing with a contagious patient. All of the problems in the infection control citations we found were eventually corrected. But inspectors did note repeat problems in half of the homes cited. It's a devastating time for humanity, but it's a devastating time, especially for the elderly population. Howard Rogers is the head of the New Orleans Council on Aging. He says in the decades he spent working with seniors, it's clear not all nursing homes are created equal. We have a lot of excellent nursing homes in this state who uh, follow the, the guidelines, who have adequate staffing. 
uh, and who are able to take care of their clients. But then we have some nursing homes who really is just uh, uh, looking for the, for, the, for the money. It's recording. Voice recording. Okay. It's recording. Hit it again. Here is the candle for best cake. It's a funny thing watching old home movies. Yes, the candle. Hey, I got it. It's like peeking in a window on someone else's memories. Can't handle it. Now, Tommy's got the right idea for cutting the cake here. I tell you what, I killed a lot of roaches with that tonight. Birthdays past, special occasions, or even the ordinary. You can see time passing in fast forward, like you're getting a glimpse of someone else's recurring dreams or nightmares. Happy birthday to you and many more. Washington was hit so hard. We had fair enough warning. They had enough advance notice. But we thought it was a nice facility. I mean, I think they're just so overwhelmed. So these people don't have to be dying in these numbers. No, I mean, this is preventable. There was a, a, a gross neglect. This is Daddy <laughs> and me. Thomas Zenko loved to cook. Stuffing. He put everything in it. He puts shrimp, uh, oysters, um, artichokes, everything. He just kind of put everything with the kitchen sink. He was a butcher, a restaurant owner, and ended his working years in the construction business. The diabetes, Parkinson's disease, and two strokes ravaged his body, leading his daughters to put him in Forest Manor Nursing Home in Covington in 2013. It's been a battle. It's been a battle to keep him safe and um, and healthy. In a sadistic irony, in his final years, a simple meal could prove fatal for the one-time chef. Zenko was what's called a silent aspirator. If he wasn't positioned properly when he ate, the food could sink into his lungs, giving him pneumonia. Every single time the doctor would say, you know, I really just don't think he's gonna make it next time, you know. He really got through this by the skin of his teeth. So they put cameras in his room at Forest Manor. They're now giving us a window on one of the deadliest nursing home outbreaks of COVID-19 in Louisiana. I initially found out on the Forest Manor uh, Facebook page. A couple of the residents, their family members had posted that they had died. And I was like, what? I'm like, Forest Manor should have told me something. The first resident died of COVID-19 at Forest Manor on April 5th, according to data from the St. Tammany Parish Coroner. Like a silent tidal wave, COVID washed over the nursing home with deadly force. Over the next two months, the infection killed mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, brothers, sisters, 38 people so far. We wanted to know how exactly did it spread so fast? I think early on, the nursing homes weren't really prepared for such an aggressive pandemic. I asked the coroner, Dr. Charles Preston, about it back in June, when nursing home residents accounted for more than half of the parish's COVID-19 deaths. He noted how vulnerable the population is to begin with. And why do you think that this is going through these nursing homes like wildfire up there? while the patient population is closed the staff population is not and so the staff comes and goes and comes and goes so you know again uh they could be negative on monday go to walmart on tuesday and become infected and shed virus for five days and not even know it in late March, Zenko's daughters started snapping pictures of staffers in their dad's room. March 22nd, no mask. April 2nd, April 3rd, the camera showed two aides moving Zenko with no masks on. They say they brought it to the attention of a staff social worker. I just thought that they should have masks at this, at this point. I could see it more like beginning of March 
But now that we're in, in April, they should have masks on. It was after Forest Manor had been declared a coronavirus cluster by the Louisiana Department of Health on March 31st, meaning Forest Manor already had more than two confirmed coronavirus cases. And days later, nurses and aides still weren't even wearing basic surgical masks. While the general public wasn't masking up at that time, healthcare workers were. Two other Forest Manor families we spoke with raised similar concerns about it. But we would lose maybe a a few days in a week, we would lose three, four people, and then it just, we lost count. Like, they come in three, but we can't even, we can't even count anymore. What are we up to, like 18, 19? A former nurse at Forest Manor who asked not to be identified says in those early days, they isolated positive patients to their rooms. Many of them were on the 500 hall. At the beginning, they didn't even put up a wall to say oh, COVID patients are going here. They just started throwing everybody into 500 without moving the people who were not COVID positive. Now we're spreading it and potentially getting everybody sick. The nurse ended up being laid off in recent months as Forest Manor's patient population dropped. She says testing was a big problem like in most American nursing homes. Only symptomatic residents were either taken to an urgent care clinic or the hospital to get tested, or they were never tested at all. This is him. At times in those final days in late March when Patrick Youngblood started to decline, his sister Liz Koenig says he had a low-grade fever, but that it wasn't unusual for his condition, complications from cancer treatment years before. He was never tested for COVID, but the longtime City Park Rose Gardener lived in the 500 Hall, the stretch of rooms that would become the COVID wing. When we were visiting outside of his window over that weekend prior to his passing, his roommate was in the room. Um, people were coming in. The nurses were coming in to check. They opened the window. I was able to visit with him and his roommate was there and he was perfectly healthy. He was not wearing a mask either. Did that set off any alarms in your head? I mean, now looking well, at back. At that time, at, at that time, I was so focused on my brother that it didn't strike me as odd. But looking back, I would have thought that perhaps every patient should have been wearing a mask. Despite the governor's ban on in-person visits, Liz was allowed to visit her brother the day before he died. So you were there on April 8th? I was. And no full PPE, just a mask like I'm wearing right mask, now. Mask, just like you're wearing. She says she's grateful to Forest Manor for that time with her brother and for the care he received. The CDC and the Louisiana Department of Health did not require testing of all residents and staff until months into the pandemic. By the time they did start testing in all facilities, half of everybody already had it. I don't know who these people are. In fact, the two CNAs that I saw without the masks, I had never seen them before. Oh, we're having to pull CNAs from other halls. I wish that when it first started, that more precautions were taken. I wish that oh, we were not allowing the staff to go back and forth to the hall. That if you worked in the COVID hall, you stayed down that hall. You did not come off of that hall. By April, Zenko was spending time out in the hall. Somebody has to watch him because he has a tendency to choke on his food. Somebody has to be there in case he starts choking. This picture is blurry, but it shows Zenko in his wheelchair in the hall. Look closely and you'll see his tray of food there. Staffers had to watch him eat. Before the pandemic, he would be taken to the dining hall. Then aides started watching him eat in his room. But in March, they started wheeling him into the hall, possibly exposing him to coronavirus patients. Zenko's daughter says this was April 3rd. Him being in the hall, he was he was a sitting duck. Uh, we did have a few that had gotten COVID on that hall. We had about maybe half of those residents pass away that had gotten it down that hall. The nurse says Forest Manor added hand sanitizing stations and staff did use gowns, masks and PPE when working with COVID patients. She says they had a good supply of PPE in the beginning, something echoed by the administrator in emails to families. When they ran out of gowns, the nurse says Forest Manor sewed arms onto hospital gowns for protection that the staff put on and off when entering and leaving the COVID hall. We could have done so much more. 
I'm sorry. There could have been more that was done mm -hmm. to protect these residents, to protect our dad, and it wasn't. In a lot of ways, I find that it was negligent. It's sad and it's senseless. Experts urge states like Louisiana to send health officials into nursing homes early on to help with infection control. The states should have put the state inspectors into these homes that have the virus and have them there all of the time uh, during the day to make sure that they have enough staff, they have enough PPE, and they're practicing safe practices. So the, a lot of states have not done that. Louisiana health officials say they worked with the CDC to do a virtual infection control assessment with Forest Manor on March 15th, a pioneering program that was later used in other states. LDH strike teams physically went into the home May 15th after the critically short supply of PPE rebounded. That was after the virus had killed 32 residents there. No one from LDH would do an on-camera interview for this story. Would it have made a difference if those agencies like the CDC and the state had come in earlier? Absolutely. The state needs to um, be more forceful. There needs to be more enforcement, more accountability. And families should be questioning why these nursing homes still have licenses. There were many sleepless nights where he wasn't sleeping at all. And he'd start calling you, and then he'd start calling me, and he'd stay up all night. So he had something mm -hmm. on his mind. Zenko's fears became a reality two weeks before state inspectors went into Forest Manor. I'm the daughter of Thomas Zenko, and I was trying to see if I could get him on the phone. He went to the hospital for a fever and a suspected urinary tract infection. He's not going to be able to use it himself, but I wanted to see if I could talk to him. Remember, throughout the ordeal, family members, Zenko's daughters, were all Hello? locked out. I don't know if he's awake in there. Oh, I know he was, he was sleeping on and off, right? Both at the nursing home and essentially at the hospital. One moment. I'm at a loss. I'm home. I'm trying to, you know, to get information from people and I'm leaving messages. Nobody's telling me anything. These are their recordings from Zanko's time during his final days at Lakeview Hospital. Hey, Daddy. Hey there. I love you. I love you. How are you doing? I feel terrible. You feel terrible? Uh -huh. After rebounding once, yeah. giving them uh -huh. hope. So this morning, um, he almost coded on me. Nurses armed with a handful of iPads. You can FaceTime you, so you cannot talk to him. Struggling to fill that void with phone calls in patients' final hours. The kidney's to fail at this point. His cardiovascular system is failing. You know, so things don't look good. Know that we might not be there, Pop, but we we are praying for you and we're thinking about you constantly. We are there with you in, in spirit. Just remember that, okay? We love you, Pop. Zenko died with no family at his side. It's the worst kind of home movie you could possibly imagine. The one where the candle goes out. Oh. <laughs> Momo did it! Momo did it! Sheila Pierce struggled with COVID symptoms for a week at Forest Manor before she was sent to the hospital and tested positive. Her daughter says she had a roommate during that time. She was Forest Manor's first COVID death on April 5th. Vanita Hoffer died Easter Sunday, April 12th. Joy Thomas died May 5th. All three families, along with Carolyn Fowler's and Thomas Zenko's, reached out to us concerned about how COVID-19 was handled, questioning decisions made by administrators, why frontline heroes had been pushed beyond their limits as COVID sent a staffing shortage into a crisis. Just go to sleep and get rest. 
Each COVID number has a story behind it, with family members wondering if this had to be their ending. Love you, Mom. We love you, Mom. We know you love us, too. God.